So good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. I very much enjoyed uh, this meeting. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, which I think is pretty much everyone, um, I'm predominantly a researcher. Uh, my group identifies genes that predispose to cancer. I'm also a clinical geneticist, and I run the Cancer Genetics Service at the Royal Marsden Hospital. Uh, and I'm really going to speak to that uh, today. Um, we are particularly passionate about trying to realize the potential of new sequencing technologies to maximize uh, patient benefit and to bring that into mainstream practice. Um, so when we got the pre-questionnaire, I was uh, amused, I think, to see that uh, on the front page it said that there weren't going to be questions about the BRCA genes because the clinical interpretation of those sequence variants was, was pretty much sorted. So I sort of first laughed, then I cried, then I started foaming at the mouth. Um, and I really wished that that were true. But the reality is that despite the fact that it's been over 15 years since those genes were discovered, and they are some of the most intensively investigated genes, both with respect to clinical practice and scientifically, we're still very far from having a consistent way of dealing with sequence variants in those genes and I think the potential uh, for chaos and harm as more um, BRCA um, mutation uh, results are available is quite high. So this um, uh, graph will be known to everybody. With respect to uh, breast cancer, the situation is that there are about 24 common variants found through GWAS with small effects. There are BRCA1 and 2, which have very high risks of um, disease. And then my group has been particularly involved in identifying uh, genes in this area um, of... You can do that because I can't move. Um, you can use your imagination. Oh, God, now I've got tr trouble. <laughs> Um, in this intermediate uh, region. So these genes are very like BRCA1 and 2. They're characterized by rare inactivating mutations, but instead of having risks of 10 to 15 fold, they have risks of uh, about 2 to 6 fold. Um, and the discovery of these genes has really uh, impacted on how I think about missense variances and VUSs. So I, I just wanted to take a, a couple of slides just to describe that to you. So the way that we find these genes is by undertaking a large scale familial case control resequencing studies. So we sequence the full gene in typically one to 2,000 familial cases and, and uh, uh, the same number of controls or more. And when you do that kind of experiment uh, for this type of gene, there's a very clear signal between your cases and controls with respect to truncating mutations. But when you look at the missense mutations, the, the data is really quite interesting. So you will always see multiple rare, usually singleton missense mutations that are only present in your cases. And these are just the type of missense variants that are called VUSs, or in gene discovery pa uh, papers where controls are not analyzed, they will often be assumed to be pathogenic because you found them in your cases. But if you are sequencing the full gene in controls, what you will see is, uh, and what we've seen for all of the genes that we've found of this type, is that there are multiple singleton rare missense mutations that are in controls only. And if you try and work out which may be pathogenic and which aren't, what you find, or what we have found, is that there's no significant difference between those two groups. You can't pull them apart, either in terms of their frequency or their position or their conservation or their pre predicted functional impact. And it's very different from those truncating mutations. So what is that telling us? Well, I think it's telling us the same as lots of other types of data, the data that Jonathan presented yesterday uh, and Les also would, uh, I think, speak to this. And that's that most missense variants in genes, particularly those in which we know that the pathogenic mutations are inactivating, are not disease-causing. Also, most missense variants that are predicted in silico to be deleterious in some way are not disease-causing. And that, that uh, categorization as deleterious, uh, which is often assumed to be the same as pathogenic, just isn't. It's incredibly difficult to pick out uh, disease-causing missense mutations, even in genes which we know cause disease. And so I think the sort of bottom line is that VUSs should be considered, and we consider them, as innocent until proven guilty. And I think that everybody does know that when you talk about it, but actually instinctively, a lot of people, even the most uh, sort of expert in these fields, are actually, when they see those variants, they think they actually manage them as guilty until proven innocent. Um, and I, I think that that's a problem. 
So with respect to clinical utility, uh, we're not using the GWAS common variance, and I, I don't think that uh, we'll be doing that in a meaningful way anytime soon. With respect to these intermediate uh, penetrance genes, I think once um, sequencing makes that cheap and uh, quick, we will be able to use them. But BRCA1 and 2 is clinically usable and uh, in, in many ways offers all that you could hope for from a, a disease gene. So I think with respect to unaffected women, um, this is uh, people are, uh, are very on top of this and they understand this. These women are at high risk of breast cancer, ovarian cancer. We give them increased surveillance. Uh, they will often have their ovaries removed after completing their family. And uh, many of them will also have uh, bilateral mastectomies. Um, I think surprisingly, it's underappreciated just how important and how helpful it is to know the BRCA status in somebody who has cancer. So if you have breast cancer and you're BRCA positive, you're at high risk of having bilateral breast cancer, you're at high risk of having ovarian cancer. Increasingly, there are genetic tailored treatments such as PARP inhibitors, which are um, uh, close to being in, in widespread use, that are tailored to that genetic defect. And this is making a sizable contribution to uh, uh, this cancer incidence. So if you take unselected ovarian cancer just walking into the clinic, over 10% of those will have a BRCA mutation, and all of those are at high risk of breast cancer, if nothing else. It's a smaller proportion of unselected breast cancer, though in certain subgroups such as triple negative, uh, it's, it's over 10%. And what I would certainly like to see, and what I hope the new um, sort of technology will uh, allow us to do, is to um, offer BRCA testing to all women with um, breast and ovarian cancer. So what are the challenges to the implementation of that? Well, we need uh, cheap quick testing, and this should be achievable. Obviously, there's also uh, the, the issue of patents, which I, I'm not going to talk about today, partly because I'm not able to talk about it unless I've drunk quite a lot of gin. So, um, <laughs> but I'm assuming that that bit will be um, uh, solvable. We need to have quick, simple report of the results, and that will have to be readily understandable by non-genetic experts. And we will need that to be then triaged into what the clinical actions should be. So, where are we with that? We're a long way off from that. Um, so we saw this slide yesterday from Les. This is one of the ways in which um, classification systems for BRCA variants are, are, are used. We don't use this. Uh, why don't we use it? I think there are a number of different problems. Um, it is a fairly arbitrary um, system based on various assumptions. That sounds like a criticism. I don't, I don't mean as a criticism. I think that uh, sort of taking your best guess is the sort of um, bedrock of clinical practice and science. I don't have any problem with that. I'm not sure that if you are guessing that you should uh, quantify that to three decimal places. Um, and I think that if you are having an arbitrary pragmatic system, you should try and have it as simple as possible and it should be tailored to the aims you're trying to achieve. And I think this is very laborious and many variants you just don't have the data in order to classify it. But I think the main problem is there are five variant classes but there are effectively only two management things. You either can manage it as a positive or a negative. And therefore, you have to, if you're trying to have this system, you have to be able to tailor that into your management strategy. So I get daily emails, I think, from people um, around the world where they've got variants that are in classes two, three, and four, and they don't know what to do about them. Um, and again, going back to these things that most th people sort of think of things as being guilty until proven innocent, there have been hundreds of women who have had their breasts removed on the basis of variants that are highly, highly likely to not be increasing their risk of breast cancer. So in part to manage my inbox and uh, in part because we wanted to think about trying to make this more user friendly, uh, over the last year we've been uh, using a different system and this is a system that we use. So we have a variant category but it's very much um, tailored towards going to a management category and in the management category it's either negative or it's positive. And I think the key difference, which was a slight moment of epiphany in my group, I think, was that instead of trying to classify every variant individually, what, there is a default category that when, when you first have a, a, a variant, if you can't do anything else to it, it goes into what we call um, our, our variant two category. So if there's, a, if there's a missense variant that's never been seen before, you actually can't move it into pathogenic. You can't move it into four. It will st and that just goes straight, that's into, and it goes straight out to getting our, our report. If uh, a, a, a variant has been seen before and has been previously categorized, obviously it goes into that uh, category. Um, 
if a variant is a frame-shifting mutation, you can just code that, that will go straight into pathogenic, because we know that it doesn't matter whether you've seen it before or not, if it's causing premature protein truncation, it is pathogenic. Um, and then we have the possibly assignable is uh, for the group where there is some information in the literature uh, but, or, or available, um, but it's not sufficient to cause, say it's pathogenic. And here we're using genetic information because at least for the BRCA uh, genes, there is no robust in silico predictive information or functional information unless it's showing that it's, uh, it's the equivalent to a, uh, a frame shifting uh, mutation that will allow you to, be, uh, to call that pathogenic. Pathogenic. So those are the categories that we use. This is, um, so following Howard's example, this is one that I did this morning because I had one in my inbox. So this is a variant here which has not been reported before. In fact, uh, the, in, the in silico uh, predictions and conservation wouldn't uh, uh, suggest that it was pathogenic. And so that goes straight out to our, our variant two, and this is what those reports say. Uh, Manage as a negative bracket test. Uh, the consultee should be informed that the bracket test was negative. Uh, I think the next bit would be a point of discussion, possibly a point for transatlantic difference. A uh, discussion of the variant is not required. There's a management recommendation. Breast surveillance should be recommended appropriate to family history, and we have that goes to a protocol. Uh, we have a number of protocols on there. The only um, uh, rule of thumb is that no protocol can be more than one page. Uh, no predictive testing should be offered for this variant. No additional analyses are currently required. So is this model transferable or scalable? Um, I think it probably is both. At the moment, our reports are going back to geneticists or genetic counselors, because those are the people who are doing those tests. But I can see how it could go into oncology if the oncology people were doing the tests. The negatives would just be negatives. In terms of the positives, the, the report would be slightly different. You'd have the information that the oncologist potentially would be using, and then there'd be another thing that would say, refer to genetics. So here, instead of genetics having to see everybody, we're seeing the positive people. We We'll do the genetic information where we'll be doing the cascading and we can manage that in terms of ours. What we can't manage is seeing everybody who's going to be negative. Um, I think there probably are other genes and systems for which it, it, it is also um, transferable. Um, what we, we often been asked, what would you, you need? What I would really like, um, I said yesterday, I think we need more data. I think we need population data. One of the major areas where we're doing mis- management is when you've seen a variant that's been seen in cases from a particular ethnic group. It's assumed to be pathogenic because it's been seen several times from a particular ethnic group, but the equally plausible, and I would say more plausible thing, is that that is a population-specific polymorphism. And unless we have really good data on these low-hanging fruit key genes from lots of populations, we are going to keep making that mistake, and I, I'm not clear that we're just going to get that data from uh, unless we directly um, um, try and get it. I think it also does give you better information about the spectrum of uh, mutations across there. And because uh, BRCA1 and 2 are old genes, there's virtually no sequence data from controlled individuals in BRCA1 and 2 because it was sort of bef done before. Uh, I mean, it's still quite a Herculean um, enterprise, but it certainly was then. We clearly need much, much better predictive in silico methods. Um, that, that's um, that's uh, a given. What I'd really like to see is some standards for deciding, uh, for us as a group or some group, to decide if genes or variants are definitely pathogenic. So really thinking about which ones we're classifying into that group. Um, I I appreciate that all the others we need to sort out as well, but at least if we can um, sort that out. And I want to just finish um, on a, a sort of cautionary tale to exemplify that. So RAD51C was a, a gene that was published in Nature Genetics, very high profile, um, about 18 months ago, and it was published as a high penetrance breast ovarian uh, gene comparable to BRCA1 and 2. It's got an omium entry, BRCA3. Um, I, I'm aware of at least one uh, woman who's prof had prophylactic mastectomies because uh, they have a, a mutation. It was a little unusual, this paper, because in it, the truncating mutations are only found in breast cancer cases if they were in families with both breast and ovarian cancer. And if you looked at families with just breast cancer only, there were no mutations. And that's obviously odd for a high penetrance breast cancer gene. Subsequent data, nobody was finding any truncating mutations, but they were finding missense mutations. So they thought, all right, okay, the missense mutations are causing breast cancer. That wasn't the original hypothesis, and no controls were studied. Um, for a variety of things, I haven't got time to go, and we were working on another gene, which is an ovarian cancer gene. 
Uh, anyway, we've looked at this, and this is hopefully shortly going to be published, but it is also consistent with all of the available data, including the original paper, I should say. So we did a large case control resequence study looking at both um, cases and controls. RAB51C is an ovarian cancer gene. It has a decent size risk of ovarian cancer, about a 9% uh, lifetime risk, but it doesn't predispose to breast cancer. So what's going on? I think it's fairly old-fashioned ascertainment bias. If you've got a gene that causes um, phenotype A, in this case ovarian cancer, and you look at phenotype B, but the, which is breast cancer in this case, but the only breast cancer cases you're looking at are relatives of your phenotype A. You are bound to see an association unless you correct for that. But if you look at phenotype B on its own, which they did, you're not going to see an association. So 18, 24 months after that first gene report, you know, the cancer risks are clarified. It's not a high-risk uh, breast cancer gene. In fact, it doesn't cause breast cancer. But you can see a potential where if we'd had the whole genome data in the um, electronic patient records, and that data was already available, and the gene comes out, and you're thinking, right, it's high-risk breast cancer. You can see there's a situation where a lot of women might have thought, right, I'm going to have prophylactic surgery or act on that. Um, and I think we're in an era where there's going to be lots and lots of new gene discoveries. When you're writing a paper, it is perhaps uh, natural that one's optimistic about the clinical utility of that, and there's often uh, in, the, in that paper, but I think there needs to be standards and that um, or principles by which um, people can look to see whether it has passed a bar where it is ready to be used um, uh, in the clinic. Um, and I think we need to uh, uh, think about that uh, now. And I'll finish then. Okay. All right, I think we used up our question time too. Sorry. Right? Unless somebody has, Heidi, you have like a quick one? Just a quick question. Um, you mentioned recommending no management in cases where there's a not assignable BRCA1 variant. You know, we study cardiomyopathy, which is a very similar paradigm in terms of dominant inheritance and high risk for sudden cardiac death and a need to manage those family members. And we would always recommend familial testing to look at segregation in order to determine the clinical significance of those VUSs. And once you get a high enough LOD score, you can say with statistical confidence that that variant is pathogenic and then use it in a predictive fashion. So I'm a little bit concerned about not encouraging those physicians to pursue familial studies, which can be extremely informative in terms of pathogenicity. So I think that uh, with respect to those um, class three ones, uh, we certainly uh, do do that. All the class three ones we then would recruit into our research and we would um, uh, do that uh, more broadly. I think this does speak to things, what should you do with just any VUS? And it then also speaks to the fact that um, are they innocent until proved guilty or guilty until proven innocent? Now, the one I talked to you about, in fact, all the in silico things would say that it's benign anyway. And we know that they're mostly benign. We're not doing that for synonymous variants. Um, so I think in terms of going, often you can't do the segregation. The families are too small. Uh, the, 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 the chance of being able to really sort that out in terms of a LOD score for breast cancer, which has got a high phenocopy rate, which also impacts in that, so it makes it very difficult, is quite difficult. So I think the problem that has is people go back to them and you're telling them, if people knew that it was innocent rather than proven guilty and they were doing it on a purely exploratory fashion, I wouldn't have so much problem with it. But I think what happens is people are assuming that if the doctor's telling you this or, or the doctor is actually telling you that it is likely to be pathogenic, that we have a problem there. And so we're doing, uh, currently we're doing more harm than good. So it, it's part of that balance. But I appreciate it's, it, it's a difficult issue. Great. Thank you. And we'll definitely have time after the panel's all done for more questions. <laughs>